Welcome to Spirituality Matters. Now I invite you to settle in and find that sacred space between here where I am and there where you are. And let us be reminded that the Holy transcends our physical bodies and our time together here is just as meaningful and sacred as if we were sitting beside one another. Okay, so now let's get started. But before I even say the podcast title, well, then I was thinking about this, that If you've made it this far and you've already seen the name of this podcast title, then you're either here because you want to know if I'm really going to talk about this or you really are intrigued and you have you're approaching today with an open mind and an open heart and a receiving soul so that we can learn something together. So the title is God is Black, Female and Gay. So you're still here. I'm glad to hear that because I know that there would have been a time in my life where there is no way I would have listened to a podcast with that title. But, and I say this often because this is an invitation for those of you who are on a similar journey as I am, which is spiritual, but not religious, or you're unchurched, or you're recovering from church trauma, or you consider yourself a spiritual nomad or in the spiritual wilderness, Nothing ever truly fits on this, on a business card. And that is okay. I hope that this teaching theme will be inspirational and in some ways healing for all of us. So the premise of this podcast theme today or teaching isn't about the physical attributes of God, not at all. In spite of that title, it's actually about releasing God from physical attributes. It's about moving the experience of God, the understanding of God to the undefinable, to the indescribable, to the unexplainable. I saw this in one in some of my research, infinite incomprehensibility, infinite incomprehensibility, like you could go on and on and on and on, and you're never going to be able to completely comprehend the essence, the being of God. Now, if you watched my story on this podcast episode, you can see, oh my goodness, I don't know how many hours I spent researching for today, and this could have easily been seven hours, but I really tried to to keep things in an overarching theme here because it's hard if you're driving or you're walking or something. I want to just really pull pull back the curtain, open up the uh, the container just a little bit, just to make you curious. That's what we try to do here. And then we'll have invitations later to go deeper into some of this experience. But one thing that I found intriguing during all of this research that I did was a concept about those, some of what we do when we humanize or domesticate God, we actually minimize the experience of God and what exactly God is in our lives and in the world. Because when we do that, then all of a sudden it's familiar because we live in the physical, we live in in reality, things are tangible, they're touchable. And when we, we, with our limited human understanding, when we try to, to use those words to describe God in a way that fits our visual reality, then we actually start to take things for granted because we move away from the sacred and the holy experience into the mundane, into the things that we tend to take for granted. So this is the problem when we humanize or domesticate the divine experience. This is a a quote that I I read in one of my uh, research and you'll, again, all these show notes will be up so you can go click away. And I invite you to do that You can go into as deep of a study about this as I did. And of course, use your own research. Go and ask your own questions to come up with this, your your understanding of who 
or what God is. And I think as we go along, you'll understand why I'm using that phrase. We want to know God and we want to have a relationship. And I'm quoting right now. We want to know God and we want to have a relationship. So we do that by evaluating our human experience, not only to see if we are God word, in other words, focused towards God, but also whether we can gauge whether God is in our lives. And I think that's a real important thing. If we can, if we feel like we, when we humanize God in, in our language and in our everyday, and we use symbolic symbolism to incorporate God in our lives as a, as, as a physical experience, then we validate our own worth that we can understand that this physical experience is affirmation for how God ebbs and flows in the world. And in my, I have to agree with the writer who said that that actually minimizes the true essence of God when we do that. Because what if we shifted our focus from understanding God in the physical and understood that God is just is. God is without having to add any descriptors to it. So you say, well, okay, but you just did that. You just added descriptor, descriptors when you created the theme for this week. I said, yeah, you're right. I absolutely did. But it, it was meant to be disruptive because so many of us that have navigated through religion have never heard of God explained, defined as a woman or defined by their, their gender or their sexuality or the, the color of their skin. It's always been through almost a white male experience. So when you do that, what do you visualize in God? Well, you've seen some of the drawings over the years and most of those are, I think, attributed to an Americanized version of Christianity that led to this fatherly figure with long flowing gray hair who's always white. So this, the reason I chose that was to very much shake us up, rattle us up, even for me, like last week, if you caught last week's podcast, I was talking about the biases that we bring, even when we think that we're navigating away from religious beliefs that we know that no longer serve our highest good, what we still hold on to. So this one, this day, this week is actually just a little bit more of us peeling back some layers to see, well, where, how, how entrenched are you into some of those beliefs? This is a good time to bring up a quote that Gandhi offered to the world. Gandhi said, God has no religion. Gandhi said that God has no religion. But for many of us, God was experienced through a patriarchal theology, so a patriarchal religion. Now, we'll talk a little bit about what patriarchy is in a little, in a little bit, but this doesn't mean that religion necessarily sanctions or approves violence towards women, but this patriarchal orientation would set up a system where the supreme authority in the home was reflected in into so those 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 values those societal cultural values where the supreme authority always flowed through the male whether and, and that went through to how land was inherited or assets were inherited it, it might even bypass if there were uh, daughters that were older, it didn't matter. It would bypass to the male. And you've seen this. And if you re read anything about history, there's all kinds of examples of how that has occurred over time. Well, religion then became a reflection of those cultural standards, which is why when you look at the Bible, it was written in a very strong patriarchal language because the people at that time who were writing those stories 
whether they were, whether you believe that they were fully written by God or they were inspired by God, they were still held in a patriarchal contextual language. So it would have been appropriate for a supreme being of a religion to be viewed as a male figure. So that continued to follow us throughout all of these years up until today where patriarchal systems still exist, but they're also very much resisted in a lot of, uh, of what, how we view the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we still don't have it in place in certain place. I mean, just look in politics in America. Sometimes I just look at the Senate floor and say, could there be any more white, gray-haired men that could fill a room? I mean, I think we, we've made strides in looking at how far women have come and how far uh, marginalized groups have come, but we have a long way to go if we're going to fully represent society that we are it's never going to be fully represented and fairly represented by a group of white gray haired men. They're off the soapbox, but that's the truth. So you still see it also in religion. So for like in Catholicism, they're still not ordaining women to be priests and some Christian denominations do not as well. I was raised Southern Baptist. And when I knew I was called to ministry, I knew that that was not going to be uh, a faith system that I was going to be able to hold on to because they're still not uh, ordaining women. But a lot of the world religions do ordain women. And I think that that's, uh, you're going to start to see changes in there as some of those restrictions and beliefs start to change and, and women start to step into their truth. I was telling, talking to my cousin this morning and I said, she was asking me something about what was going on with me. And I, we started talking about my gra our grandmother. We always do. We always uh, kid each other about who was her favorite. And just so you know, Jelda, I was her favorite. And I know she'll hear this and I'll get something back from her. But I, it just occurred to me today when I, I thought about my own ancestral heritage and how many people were ministers in my life that my grandmother would have been an, a wonderful minister. She was passionate, she was knowledgeable, she was fiery, but her, she had a limited belief and she accepted that because that was the religion of her heritage. So she, she dutifully did her, her responsibility as a woman inside the Southern Baptist tradition. But I often wonder what gifts of the world to the world that she could have given as a minister because she could preach. The rest of us got it. The world didn't. And that makes me sad to some reason. So I hope I am honoring her in, in some ways. So looking again at, um, at this patriarchal experience that we see inside religion where people will talk about God and they'll, they'll often be referred in uh, as a male. So, you know, a lot of times they'll say, you know, God, he will provide and, and that kind of language, because you see that in scripture quite often as well. But if we start talking about God, as it's referenced in the Bible, there are many more ways than just the male version of defining God that yes, we can even find in the Bible. Now, this today is really going to be about the Christian context, but that's because that's what I know. And I know that that's a lot of what the majority of the people here that will be, will be talking about today. But I encourage you that, especially that we hear from people all the time from different religions who are recovering from religious trauma, who have also spiral, spiraled out of their religious experience and the, and the religion of the, the faith, their, their faith of their heritage. And we welcome you here. And we think that even though it's specifically related to Christianity, we think that we can um, help you with some of what you're dealing with, with your religious trauma. So I hope that even though it's going to be focused on Christianity, that this, that this helps you in some way. So we're going to start talking about what Christians call the Old Testament. And I just talked a little bit about this last week, but it's never... It, there's you, you can never not stop talking about appropriation. It's so important for us to stay awake 
and understand that our impact of our words and our place in the world and how we either accept other people's beliefs and their value and their space in this world, or we continue to overpower them in our entitlement and our self-righteousness. So we, it's never ever wrong to always make sure that we're speaking mindfully and respectfully of other people's traditions. So there is a theology that's called replacement theology that many Jewish people will tell you that they fully reject because what happened when the Christ, when Christianity brought what they call the Old Testament, which is still an active Bible for the, for the Jewish people, it's the Hebrew Bible. So we call that the Old Testament, put it with the New Testament, that became the canon for Christianity. So the replacement with uh, theology says, well, now that's no longer valid as the Hebrew Bible. It's now the Old Testament because we replaced it to go with the New Testament because Jesus fulfilled the prophecy that was in the Hebrew Bible. That is called, that's religious appropriation. And so for those of us who are in a inner faith and inner spiritual and navigate spirituality and understanding that these paths that we're all on here together deserve respect and honor that that's the way we show up in the world, that the way we, we, we reflect God back to the world, understand that we have to be mindful of how we're using this. So for today, I'm going to reference this as the Christian, the Christian uh, Bible's Old Testament, but it's also the Hebrew Bible. So I know you'll, you'll get tired of hearing me say that. I'm sorry, with all due respect, I will continue to say that. So many times in the Bible, you will, you will see, and this is where I think that as we have, as the Bible has been translated, we start to lose some of the impact as we water down the language to make it more palatable and understanding for those of us who did not study years and years of Greek and Hebrew to understand what the Bible was really saying. You have to understand that the Bible was written as one long, big, long text somewhere a long time ago, someone divided it up into chapters and verses and things like that. And that, that there's no doubt that that changed some of the meaning, meaning of the scriptures, but also in the original Hebrew, there were many names for God in the Bible, but depending on what version you use, it will literally change the meaning. So for instance, and again, all these are in the show notes, go research this for yourself. And I'm just going to name a few, but you can go, you can also, there's books out there called the many names of God and you can, and you can study these. And again, just from the biblical reference right now is what we're using, but some of the names would be Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord, our provider, provider, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Ra, Jehovah Sikini, uh, Jehovah Shama, and it goes on and on and on. But I want to show you something, and I'm going to have to click over here real quickly to show you a text and the meaning that I, that I was talking about. So here in Genesis 22, 14, I'm looking right now at the New International Version. Here's what it says. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Okay, so the Lord will provide. That's what it was named. That's what the New International Version says. But if I go to the King James Version, oops, wrong one. If I go to the King James Version and I look at this, it says... And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. So to me, that's important because it can't be, it, it's either a descriptor or it's a name. So then I go to the message, which is going to be one of the most informal translations that you can get. But it's a great language to start. It's a great translation to start with if you're just starting to uh, study the Bible. And here it says, Abraham named that place God Yaira. God sees to it. That's how it 
translate God's God Yaira. That's where we get the saying on the mountain of God, he sees to it. Now that's actually the verse. Let me read it again. Abraham said that that place is God Yaira. That's where we get the saying on the mountain of God, he sees to it. Do you see the difference? How important translations make and why it is important. And that's why I do love the fact that you can access the Bible right now. I'm using biblehub.com uh, where you can get different variation uh, translations of the Bible right there and you can compare them to one another. And I think if you're really wanting to understand as close as you can to the original meaning, that's what's so important. So look at different translations so that you can see what's happening here. Now, the importance of this is because the language is everything. The language that was used in the original Hebrew was very intentional to show the many characters of God. But if you're using a Bible that doesn't even pick up that name and it's either been translated Lord or God, or it just gives the descriptor, it's easy to see God as just one physical being that fits the man in the sky that looks like your great, great grandfather. And instead of this being that these descriptors, these descriptors were attempting to convey with these different names. So I think it's a wonderful spiritual practice for you to go through the Hebrew Bible and look at these names and pick them out and just study them. So what does it mean to you for if you are going to read about Ezekiel, Ezekiel 48, 35, where it says Jehovah Shama, and this, and that translate that translates to God is here or the Lord is here. What does here mean to you? How does that, how does that mean God is showing up in your life? Where do you feel the divine presence? And it's okay to say you don't. But if you don't, what is it about you that is inviting healing? Because sometimes if we're holding on to things so tightly from our past, that doesn't move us through the healing experience, the release experience. Life is not static. Healing is not static. Education is not static. Spirituality is not static. It's all about moving. So these kinds of practices show us we, where we are static. Where do we, where are we stuck? So the names of God, spiritual practice might be something that will speak to you. And that's an easy one. That's an easy one to do. So I want to shift gears for just a minute and talk about an experience I had with a colleague who was of the Hindu faith. Now, even before I share this experience, I am only sharing my colleague's experience I'm not speaking as a scholar of the Hindu faith. I'm just sharing what this person said to me as Hinduism meant to her at the time. But we were talking about the, the supreme being, being the divine experience, the holy God, whatever name you want to give, the, give to God. And this is what she had to say. She said, we believe in an all-pervasive supreme being, which is transcendent. This, this, it's both creator and this unmanifest reality. In other words, it's, it's just, it's just is. It's just there. God is. But they also, she said, we believe in these divine beings that exist in these unseen worlds. And these are part of our rituals and our sacraments and our personal devotionals. And they believe that these reflect the elements of the Supreme, the Supreme Being because the, the divine is so infinite that these smaller deities reflect the awesome, magnificent power of the divine because it's 
there's no way it can be contained into one being that these elements of other spirits or divine beings reflect back up the power of the one supreme being. So that was her, her explaining to me what it meant to have so many different name uh, deities inside the Hindu faith. And the reason why I think that's important to bring this here is because not because necessarily the Hebrew Bible was reflecting different elements of gods inside those names. It's, but to me, it runs congruent that it's another way that a, a religion is, is attempting to use human words, which are always going to fall short in trying to describe the magnificent, the the elements of the unexplainable of the divine. So the, the Hebrew language went to taking elements of God and, and changing the name. The Hindus have a divine being that the smaller deities point up to the power of that, of the supreme being. And I just love that that's how the translation of their spirituality came out to be. And I think this is another important thing for us to do, at least to have a, a, a minimal understanding of what other faith traditions believe. There will be a link in the show notes that give you just like the 10 or 12 elements of some of the world religions. And I share that with caution because as someone who is interfaith, interspiritual, spiritual, but not religious, I also remind you that religion isn't the only container. But when we, when we study religion, we are also understanding, we're, we're peeking back in history to look at some of our ancestral heritage that, that ebbs and flows through us and certainly empowers us and impacts us even today. So now I want to shift you a little bit to understand that the Bible also gives us permission to look at God from a, not just a, um, a male perspective, but a female perspective. And that's where people get uh, caught up very often, where they will say, if you use the word goddess or divine feminine or the sacred feminine, they think I'll get accused of being a heretic when it's right there in the Bible that God gives us many symbol. The Bible gives us many symbolisms that God has a feminine side, that God is feminine inner energy, that God is a nurturer, caretaker, whatever this energy is that you call God is just as powerful and meaning in its feminine form than it is in the masculine. This resistance to that points back to our patriarchal belief system that we can't let go of. I've had people come in and comment, well, I no longer go to church or, and I, you know, I don't believe like that anymore, but God is a he. Why would you even argue that? Why would you have to come in and argue for something that you say you no longer believe? Because it, that, that's how entrenched fear-based theology, that's how influential, influential it can be to your essence. Because all of a sudden I'm shaking that person up and they don't like it. So they're pushing back at me to get it right, even though they have no sub substantive evidence other than that's what they believe. And I find it fascinating. And what often happens is when I'm fascinated, I want to understand more. If you're rejecting the belief system, why are you still holding on that belief? They cannot answer it. It makes no sense. They, they, will, they, will, they will discontinue the conversation and block me. And all I'm trying to do is really understand what is this about? I'd love to know more because I think it could help me in our ministry where we're helping people to try to deconstruct from these very same beliefs that you're holding on to. All right, so God revealed in the feminine. We're going to start with a, a name that you may sound that may sound familiar if you were part of our podcast last week, and that is Julian of Norwich, which is also, she was also came to be known as uh, Juliana. She was a mystic 
and um, she very much practiced her mysticism. She uh, lived, she, in her later years, she lived the life of a recluse and all she wanted to do was study and be in the presence of the divine. So she very much is a, uh, just a, a beautiful human being and someone that if you want to learn more about, this is the person to learn more about. If you want to understand about what a mystic, a true mystic looks like. She wrote, our savior is our true mother in whom we are endlessly born and out of whom we shall never come. She also said, as truly as God is our father, so truly God is our mother. So we're, she, we're talking, she was writing in the 14th and the 15th centuries. This, in this esoteric language, she understood the feminine power of the divine. And she was inviting us into that dance, that conversation with her. And if I point to the right website, and I did, I have some other places. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this. This will be in the links of the show notes, but there's a website that lists all the places where God is defined as a woman. And I'm just going to read through them real quickly. This, um, this one here, I love this one. God is bringing forth a new, new humanity like the pangs of a woman in labor. Her hour has come. If in God we live and move and have our being, in other words, like a, like a woman bringing forth, bringing forth uh, birth, from the beginning to now, the entire creation has been groaning in one great act of giving birth. A lot, a lot of symbolism around that, that. Those were New Testament writings. I'm going to give you a couple in the, um, in the uh, Hebrew Bible as well. The old, the, what the Christians call the Old Testament. In Proverbs, it says, she is your life, the giver of life. So a lot of this is about wisdom. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you a couple other verses about this as well. So, and why, again, translations are important. Proverbs 8, uh, 22, like wisdom herself before the foundation of the earth, I was there. Wisdom comes from God, was created by God. Now notice that it says like wisdom herself. Now this writer of the, on this um, website does not say what uh, translation they are using here, but I want to go now, let me see if I can find it. I did. We're going to look at Proverbs 4.13. And this is the King James version that I'm reading to you, but listen to this. Take fast hold of instruction. So wisdom is being translated to instruction here. But take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her for she is thy life. So the translators of the King James Version, which, you know, King James had his own reason for wanting to rewrite the Bible. Not all of them were as ethical as what we'd like to think, because I know there are people who are just steadfast. If it's not written in the King James, it's not part of the Bible and not going to argue with that today. But notice they held on to the feminine, that the, the wisdom is the feminine energy of God. But look what happens when I change the translation again. If I go to the new international version, this becomes, let me click it here. Well, there it goes. Listen what, it, well, listen what this comes to now. Remember, it, it was her and she. This is what New International Version says. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well. For it is your life. Now, I can't point to the reasons why the translators would feel the need to mute the power of the feminine that was in the original Hebrew words to change the pronouns from female to 
to it, to non-descriptive being. But my guess is that there was a strong patriarchal influence to do so. And that's sad because that once again affirms those who are entrenched in this belief without understanding why they believe that God can only be viewed in the masculine. And now you start to see why that could be a problem or why that limits our humans. We're already limited just because we are in this place and time with words that can never completely describe, with brains that can't completely comprehend, with our limited understanding of reality to really be able to grasp the vastness, the mysterious of God. But when we're also suppressed by someone else's agenda that further limits what we are understanding, especially if we're not doing the work on our own. If we're being spoon fed from the pulpit, I only believe what's coming from there. I don't know how many times I, but I have to admit, I've also been guilty of saying this in the past. Well, my pastor says, well, my pastor says, beloveds, I'm honored I, that so many of you are following me. But when you say Rev Carla says, and I, I am inviting you into areas of, to, of study, but I also encourage you to find it for yourself. I'm not here to be your guru on any of these. I'm pointing you to places so you can figure out what it is that you, that, that you and the divine can find on your own. This, this, is a, this is an intimate personal experience between you and the holy. So this spiritual path that you're on, the spiritual journey, what I'm inviting you to do is giving, I'm giving you tools so that you can go do this on your own. You don't need me to point you to right or wrong, yes or no, up or down, left and right, to the extent that religious beliefs aren't suppressing human rights. That is my biggest banner. Human rights always takes precedence before religious beliefs. Other than that, please move into your sacred space to find your inner truth. I believe that that's what religion's main responsibility should have been a long time ago. All right, moving on, getting long-winded here on a couple of things. I didn't expect that because this, this week really made me nervous. I didn't want to leave you feeling as if like, well, she didn't really make a case for this, but I feel like I am. I feel like right now, if we had to stop right now with God is black, um, female or gay, I would hope that you would see that when we have in the Bible, we have language that shows us this universal divine being is about all of humanity, regardless of how religion sometimes tends to shrink the God experience to say, well, only if you do these 10 things can you have the divine experience. I don't believe that. If that works for you and that's the way you experience God, blessings on your journey. But when that becomes the way you think everyone else should believe, that's where we have the conflict. Okay, so we're switching gears to God revealed in us. But if you're looking at me right now, you notice that I look different. That is because when we were in the middle of recording this podcast, we had an epic pow power failure that not only impacted me, but uh, Mackenzie, who is recording this remotely. So it was quite interesting, and we just had to go with it. So now you get me a new attire and these awesome hats. Stay tuned for this. And so I just had to wear it. It's Friday afternoon. We've had an incredible week, very productive, lots of exciting things coming. So just stay tuned. Now we're going to get focused back on this, on our information here to finish up this, this podcast. So as I said, we're getting ready to shift gears to talk about God revealed in us. And I want to start with, this is where we have to be willing 
to look at the language of the Bible through a mystic's lens. So if you recall last week, we talked a little bit about um, the mystical path, what it means to let go of under, trying to understand the rigid dogma of uh, your theological uh, framework for which you might be experiencing your belief. But not that there's anything wrong with that. Theology gives us a structure. It gives us a path. It gives us a, a way to understand our faith, our, our spiritual journey. But there's many theologies. So what if we start to release those to look at how all of humanity is connected through a divine experience? So one of the first places that you start to notice that. So when you look at the what they call the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament in the Christian Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John is exceptionally different than than uh, the first three books. So I love the beginning of this where it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning through him, all things were made without him. Nothing was made that has been made in him was life and the life was the light of all mankind. So do you hear all that inclusive universal language? Regardless of your beliefs, regardless of your faith, there is a space inside the Christian belief that expands that table to include all of humanity. Now, there will be people who will disagree with that. But my, theologic, my theological framework is that this is the kind of language that cannot be separated from the teachings of Jesus. So when you hear about through him, all things were made and without him, nothing was made that has been made and that life was the light of all mankind, that includes you, that includes me. So I, I, I just want you to hold on to that when you start to feel um, duality and duality means that we separate ourselves from others, or we separate ourselves from others' spiritual journeys, or we separate ourselves from the mystical, the divine mystery. We are all inclusively one, one together, one and the same. And that is an invitation to look at religion's efforts to try to explain the unexplainable. And that is exactly what world religions or any kind of spiritual experience, whether it's, whether it's a religious experience or a non-traditional uh, spiritual experience outside of religion, all of them are trying to point you toward, down the path just to go a little farther. The goal shouldn't be to get us down the path so far that we become so ingrained in our path that we can't see the others coming along with us. That should not be the goal of our religious experiences or any of our spiritual traditions. So I want to take that one more uh, step. In John 14, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will make come to him and make our abode with him. So what I like about that is that you're starting to see how the Christian experience allow, invites you into that unity with the divine. Further on, 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, do you not know that you are a temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? Do you not know that? There is no separation between us and the divine. Now, I love this. Once again, we're in John. If you keep noticing, I'm very, John has this very mystical, esoteric language that transcends some of the, uh, the physical stories about Jesus. This is more about our communion with God, our communion with the spirit. And what I love about this verse is it, it's explaining, it starts to attempt to give us um, definition around the Holy Spirit. So in John 14, 16 through 17, it says, and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. It, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it, it neither sees him nor knows him. 
You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. There's no conditions in there. He dwells in you and will be in you. Now, we'll, that is definitely in a masculine, masculine language, but there's also um, that there can be inferred that this is genderless. This Again, we're looking at a, a patriarchal system who would have used that kind of language to, and it, and it really would depend on the translation. And maybe I'll go look and see what other translations say later and we'll come back to you. But the important thing here is that this, this essence, this being that dwells in us, that I consider what, what is our soul connection, isn't something that's exclusive to one way of believing. It is all-encompassing. It is universal. Now, I want to uh, talk about one more verse, and we're going to shift to the the Christian, um, the Christian's Old Testament, the Christian Bible's Old Testament, which is also called, uh, also known as the Hebrew Bible, because one of my favorite verses in all the Bible is found in First Kings, chapter nineteen, verse twelve, and this is talking about God's voice being found in the in just the still small voice. It says, after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. That tells me that so often we are looking, once again, for the, in the wrong way. We are looking for the spectacular. I, have, I don't know how many people tell me that they don't know if they know the experience of God. They don't know if they're connected. They don't know if, they, if they're affirmed or if they're worthy or if they're loved. And because they don't experience it, they, they, they doubt themselves. They doubt their validity. They doubt their, their worthiness and nothing, nothing could be farther from the truth. If I had to sit here today and tell you whether or not I feel seen or loved or affirmed, I can't, I can't point to anything specific other than I know not to look for the earthquakes, what I would consider like these massive miracles. And, and can they happen? Absolutely. And have I had those kinds of experience sometimes in my life? Yes. And maybe someday I'll even write a book about them or something or tell a story in a video. But really, where we find the pockets of sacredness in our everyday life is actually found in the still small voice, in the silence, in the peace that you can find when you are comfortable enough to sit with yourself and do some spiritual practice. What am I grateful for today? and maybe write those out. What are my, some of my biggest fears? Where is my anxiety coming from? Why am I triggered when someone seems to question my integrity when I know I've done nothing wrong? I just had a specific incident with someone who I was in spiritual care with where that was a, a, a big trigger for this person. And helping them see that just because that person said that about them isn't true, but what is it about you that you are holding that on as your truth? Is that something you can take into your spiritual practice? Because that still small voice, that which is in us, that universal love, that universal divine mystery is in us. How do we connect with that wisdom in the still small voice, in the silence of who we are? Because sometimes we start to suppress that because that work can be hard. That soul work, I've said this often, that if I had known how much work, the kind of soul work that I have been doing these past nine years, I said it would have been easier just to stay asleep and stay in church instead of going the unchurched route because this is deep sacred work and how we improve this physical vessel 
so that the soul can be more present in this in this human experience, I believe is the foundation to what a spiritual practice, what your spiritual journey should be while we are here. Okay, let's start to wrap this up. Um, you may have a belief that God is male, and you may have a belief that God is white. And some of us have heard those kinds of sermons our entire life. You may actually find comfort in envisioning a God that looks like your great, great grandfather with the long flowing white hair and the big beard and this massive of a, of a human being sitting in the sky. I'm not telling you not to do that. If that's something that you find comforting to you, if that inspires you towards your spiritual truth, beloved, do that. Be there with your spiritual experience, with your sacredness. But that does not mean that the rest of us who do not resonate with that vision of God does not belong on this mountain with you, this pathway that's taking us up to the sacred. Because so many of us who do not believe that have felt that our voices have not been heard. We have felt that we have been suppressed. We have been told that our religious beliefs prevent us from fully realizing who we are, our passions, because we've been, it's been told to us that unless we believe in a God in a certain way, that we aren't worthy of this divine love, of this divine spirit experience. And that's what I'm telling you is not true. That is not true. That is the reason that, that this, top, this topic for this week was intended to be a disruptor so that we can shake some of us, even those, even those of us who sit on the periphery of organized religion and we're looking for this spiritual path can, can think about certain things and it can rattle us to say, wait a minute, I no longer am accountable to a church, but what are you saying about God being gay? What are you saying about God being black or female? Well, if all I'm doing is using the sacred scripture that I've used since I was six years old, I can find, point to multiple scriptures that what I believe and the title of this podcast are true. And I hope that our experience today has helped you a little bit farther down that path. Now, we will continue to come back to these themes because there's a lot to talk about. But today is another one of those portals where I'm inviting you to consider these elements of the sacred because the universal language of the Bible is for all of us. There are no exceptions, beloved. It's for all of us. And I'm going to close with the final one, which is about Genesis uh, 9.13, which is where God places the rainbow as a covenant with humanity, that he will never destroy humans again. And that was very, it's very important because I recently just had a, a, a swell of energy around that in the, in the TikTok realm because of pushback on, that I've received on the fact that people are claiming the rainbow as their own and that no one else in the in the physical realm are worthy to claim it as their own. That's ridiculous. And that's basically what I was saying in the videos. And I go back to the Bible to once again to, to prove that. Genesis 9:13 says, I do set my, my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. How are you excluding others when it says all? Who are you to put perimeters on that? Where is the asterisk? It's not there. And so I invite you to consider yourself as belonging in that covenant. The story behind that, whether there are people who hear that story and take it literal, and there's people who take who understand that that was a large S hyperbole story that was meant to 
uh, capture how the, the, the vast greatness and the, the, the divine mystery of, the, of, the, of God by creating this largest story that had elements of wisdom for us to even today, which is all of humanity is sacred. So besides all these names of God that we've we've covered today that basically originated from the Christians Old Testament and the entirety of the Bible, we saw that God has so many names. And like I said, I encourage you to to go back and, and go through some of the show notes and read some of those because it, it's, it's very beautiful. It's very inspirational to read some of those those names but they do not adequately capture the true meaning or the nature of this divine being. So I wanna add my own list here of some of the things that where I have heard in the inner faith, inner spiritual world and things that resonate with me. So God is light, love, universal wisdom, divine mystery, source, source energy, cosmic Christ, the Holy, the One, Most High, the Great Spirit, the Still Small Voice. It is time, beloved, to release God back into the entirety of humanity because God is indeed Black, female, gay, non-binary. God is, just is because God said, I am that I am. You who are known by so many names, but none capture the wonder, the mystery, and love of all that you are. Blessed be and amen. Now, be paying attention to the website at revcarla.com. We will be announcing a workshop entitled God is Gay very soon. So be looking for that information along with a, a few very exciting announcements that will be coming soon. But I pray that what we offered you today affirms you and allows you to move into your authenticity and live your truth. Okay, beloveds, I'm honored to be in this space with you and I pray you receive something because I know that I did. The teacher teaches what she needs to hear. And now, beloveds, go in peace and be at peace. Go and know that others are on this journey with you. You are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved just the way you are. Blessings on your week and I shall see you soon. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in to another Unka episode of Spirituality Matters. To submit questions to Rev Carla, email us at spiritualitymatters at revcarla.com. Follow at Rev Carla on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Pinterest for more spirituality teachings. Check out her blog posts at revcarla.com and sign up for email alerts while you're there so you don't miss a thing. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Bye for now!